10 minutes time. Awesome. So hi everyone. My name is V and I'm the director of Mood Club for this year. Um, so today we're going to be having the if wait. so today we'll be having the how to moot club of uh, well, how to moot workshop. Obviously, for here. Thanks so much for joining us. Sorry, I'm just getting a few messages. Do, 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 do. So before I begin, I'd like to tell you that we'll be recording today's session. So it's available for other people online on Facebook. So if you feel more comfortable turning off your camera while we record this session, that's completely fine, even though I'd love to see your faces. But feel free to turn off your camera. Awesome. So. Thank you. So to begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which QT stands, the Turbo and Yagara people, and acknowledge that these lands on which QT stands have always been places of learning. So today we have the how to moot shop and we have our friend, we have Riley here who is very experienced and she's such a vibe. So uh, without any further ado, Riley, this is your moment. Thank you, V, and thank you everyone for coming along. Um, so we'll try and keep this fairly, um, sorry, one second. I don't think that will turn down. Um, we'll try and keep this fairly relaxed and um, I might get questions as we go um, and just try and make this as intro level um, as possible. So we'll start with, um, I'll start with a quick acknowledgement of country. So um, as V had stated, the uh, QUT Law Society acknowledges the Turrbal and Yagara people and that this uh, land has traditionally been used as places of learning. Um, so basically I'll give you a quick rundown on why I'm relatively credible in this area of mooting. So I am currently the Director of External Competitions for the Law Society. So if you have any questions about mooting or competing, um, please reach out. I'm loved, I love talking about mooting and I would love to chat. Um, and if I can't answer your question, I know who will be able to and I will be able to send you to the right person. So, um, sorry, one second. So essentially, if you're here, you may have an idea already of what mooting is, um, but if not, Mooting is essentially your courtroom advocacy in a fun simulated form in the sense that this is for students to learn and um, get a real grasp of advocacy skills in a sometimes more relaxed but also sometimes really competitive environment. And this will be a contest of those legal arguments in a mock courtroom setting. And there will be, depending on the form of mooting that you're doing, a judge or um, an arbitrator or someone who um, you speak your arguments to and they will sort of give you advice and feedback at the end which is always I would say the most important part of any move that you do is the feedback that you receive at the end. Um, so the benefits of competing or just trying moving out uh, it will really allow you to focus on unique legal issues and sometimes some really niche legal issues which will improve your legal research and writing and advocacy skills um, the more you do these things, the more um, competent you become. So I know when I first started, I was a really, really nervous public speaker and really struggled with that, um, particularly just speaking really quickly and um, panicking when I was asked questions. And as I've progressed, um, it becomes far more natural. And not only that, that the networking benefits of mooting have been fantastic and you will meet some really awesome people along the way who are also really keen to just give things a crack um, and try things out. So going forward, if you um, are keen to give it a go, you can move on to Moot Club and then you, there are real opportunities to represent the university or in the Law Society in some bigger competitions. So to get things started, um, the basic terminology is that you will have two parties in your Moot 
And this is firstly your appellant or your applicant or your claimant. And this is the party who is bringing the claim to court or um, has been unhappy with the original decision and is therefore um, bringing the action. So the respondent on the second side will be directly responding to the claims brought by the applicant or the claimant or the appellant, depending on the situation of the mood that you're in. Um, and you will be provided with all of this information. Sorry, guys. So there shouldn't be uh, too many issues with knowing who you are and um, which party you're representing and the like. Um, when you do bigger competitions, you will likely represent both parties at some point in time, and you'll have to have an understanding of the facts relating to both of those issues. Uh, when you do smaller competitions or moot club, for example, you're only going to need to know which are the side for one of those parties. Um, so further to that, in regards to the terminology, um, advocacy really is just not about being aggressive or um, fighting for a point. It's not a fight. It, it will never be a fight. Um, you should always speak really calmly and uh, coherently to your judge and when you address the other side. So some really good terms are just along the side of that screen there. So when you're addressing um, your uh, other party or your other speaker so you'll have two speakers on your team um, that will be your uh, my learned friend or my um, learned senior or my learned junior and the other side will be my learned friend or um, our learned friends depending on the terminology that you decide to use with your partner um, it's really important to make sure that you and your partner use the same terms throughout it's really coherent and really cohesive if you can do it that uh, that way so in the teams that I've been in, <clears throat> you make a list at the beginning and you pretty much stick to those terms throughout. So I think we used our learned friends or um, in Jessup at least we use my co-agent and those are different courts, so different referrals. But um, if you can make it clear with your partner, as long as the two of you are using the same term, um, everything's fine. So when you get your moot problem, there will be a set of facts depending on the size of the problem. It will be uh, fairly large sometimes. Um, I've come off the back of a competition where we had about 30, 40 odd pages of facts. Um, if you're doing moot club, it'll be a lot shorter than that. So, <laughs> and V's nodding along. Um, yeah, it'll be a lot shorter than that. But you're not coming to contest the facts that are on the page. You're there to focus on the issues of law which arise on the facts. And usually when you begin, you'll be able to see them quite clearly um, and there shouldn't be too many issues with identifying the issues of law. Um, so there's a little example there of what a set of facts might look like. Um, and it really varies from situation to situation. Um, and every competition that you do will have a rule book. So it's important to read these to know, um, firstly, whether you're even eligible and secondly, um, whether when your due dates are for your written submissions and your written submissions are always going to be before your oral submissions. Thank you. So you do need, just need to give the court some sort of um, time to read your submissions. The judge needs time to process that and then they can ask you really good uh, efficient questions when you're presenting. Um, so once you've gotten your problem and you've had a look at the rules, it's time to start researching, which I think is my favorite part of mooting because you really do get to learn so much along the way and maybe not all of it will be completely relevant to the problem at hand, but um, it can just be a really fun time to hone your skills and learn to oh, survive. So yeah, we got a message in Slack just saying. Really jumping support them. Um, I might just get everyone to mute their computers if that's okay. Thank you very much. Um, so the first thing I would suggest is to read your problem two, three, four times and don't be overwhelmed by the amount of resources that are gonna be out there to help you get started in your research. Um, I like to focus myself on the question, um, like what are you looking for to tell the court? What does the court, um, what sort of relief can the court grant you and how can you justify why you want that? So if you're looking for particular terms, start just with that definition. What are the elements? Um, what do those authoritative cases say? And how can you weaponize those cases? So how can you draw an analogy or contrast from that particular case law? Um, it might be as simple or as difficult 
as finding one judge somewhere in an appellate court who has said that they disagree with a particular ratio. But, you know, you just have to try and pull at straws sometimes. Um, it is important when you're looking at case law to really keep an eye on what decisions will be binding or influential in the particular courts that you're appearing in. So um, you'll know from your facts whether you're appearing in the High Court or the Court of Appeal and whether the High Court can take any sort of um, credence from other cases that have been decided uh, that you're referencing. So the judge is likely to ask you, why should I listen to this? Um, yeah, so from there, when you're considering cases, it's really good to take a good um, and really synthesised case note. It may be the case that a judge will say, oh, you just mentioned uh, Strong and Woolworths. Can you give me a case summary on that and how that relates to your case? And um, it's kind of a flex to just be able to cite that off and say, this is the, uh, the facts of the case and this is why it applies in this instance. It is also really important in your research to not just look over cases that you think might not be helpful to your argument. Um, you think, oh, they might help, help the other side and not so much my argument. Um, it's really important for the court to consider both of those cases and you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not familiar with cases that help the other side. Um, it's important to just have your head around everything and that way when um, those sort of cases come up by your opposition, you can sort of pinpoint what does or doesn't work for them. Um, so once you've done a bunch of research and you're ready to put that into your written submissions, I have a little example here um, kindly from Ali Feeney. And this is, I believe, her quilt submissions. Um, just a little excerpt there of what the beginning of your submissions will look like. And it's pretty likely that if you head onto the High Court website, you'll be able to find a copy of written submissions. Um, if you just type in mooting written submissions on Google, you're going to be able to find something to compare your submissions to. So um, you're usually capped at a pretty limited amount of pages. So for internal comps, it's somewhere between two and three pages. Um, we've just finished Jessup and that was a 10,000 word limit. So it ended up somewhere around 40, 50 pages. Um, so you are limited in how much written uh, submissions you can put in. Um, it will be a really plain and compelling point that you need to put in. So um, the idea is not to do any sort of flowery language. This is where you can really hone your concise writing skills. And that Isaacs and IRAC method that you apply in your examinations and the sort of problem questions that you get in assignments um, is really helpful here. So in a matter of about one sentence, you can state the law, uh, state the issue, and then apply it and reach your conclusion. It doesn't have to be long and it doesn't have to be um, really like um, complex language. It can be just really basic. As long as um, it's simple, it will be compelling is how we've sort of um, approached things in the past. Um, in terms of your oral submissions, this, aside from the research, is like a really, really fun part and kind of where all the hard work uh, from your research and writing pays off. So if it's your first time um, submitting orally, it can be really daunting. And I know the first time that I spoke uh, in a moot was genuinely so scary, um, but everyone is really supportive and wants you to do well and wants you to use this as a learning experience. So it's important to consider this as um, more of a formal conversation with the bench and not a speech and not a presentation. So as you progress through your submissions, you need to be prepared to be interrupted and to engage with the bench on any questions they ask on the points that you give them. So you're explaining your argument to the bench. You know it better than anyone else. You're guiding them through the submissions that you have prepared. And a judge will ask you questions throughout to try and test your knowledge or on particular points or maybe see how compelling you can be. And this really is just an opportunity for you to show your understanding of the case and assist them in their questions, which is really compelling. And it will make your argument so much stronger. So. Your scoring uh, in particular moots, it always varies, but um, scoring does consider the most compelling argument and who won the moot, but it also considers the way that you present and the way that you engage with the bench. And it's really important when you're answering questions to keep a level of decorum and um, make sure that you're engaging in a really formal manner whilst also being able to engage like a conversational tone. Um, and of course, it will depend on the sort of moot that you're doing. So, um, as we go through, um, I'll hammer home that it's not a speech 
and that it's super important that you're maintaining eye contact. And there's a few tricks for doing this, particularly as we've sort of moved into Zoom mooding. There's been a lot of that in the past couple of years. Um, it's quite easy to do and to maintain eye contact as you moot on Zoom on the basis that you're staring at the screen and you can pretty much put your script or your notes or whatever you use on the screen and kind of read from there and it's close enough to the camera that you should be able to come across as if you're looking at the camera and you don't know that there's a script or um, notes in the way. But the downside of Zoom mooting, which is really important on a uh, in-person moot is that you can be super conscious of the judge's expression and the sort of engagement that they have with the bench and with you as you speak. <clears throat> so it's important there to just be watching the way that they engage with you. If they look a little confused on a point, it might be really helpful to uh, never like ask them if they know what you're talking about, but more just go back to what you were saying and maybe give them another case example or um, something that you think would be more compelling on that point and then continue to move through. Um, it's really important to speak super slowly and make sure that everything you say is coming across, um, pardon me one second, um, is coming across in a coherent manner. Um, your time management is something that you'll be judged on in most moots. Um, the way that I understand it is if you have two pleadings and you've got 10, you've got 20 minutes, split it in half, or at least know how long it's going to take you to get through those particular pleadings. Um, and that way, when you're looking at your timer, as you speak, and you know, you're at nine minutes and you've got a couple of minutes to go try and wrap up that point and tell the judge where you're going. So, um, it really helped me. And I know that it helps other people to have prepared phrases for those sorts of things. Um, And I like to use sort of a noting the time, I will proceed on the next round of my submissions or your honor, that's the highest I can take this point at the time and I will move on to the next point of my submissions. So just um, know where you're going with it and know sort of in terms of time, how much things, how long things will take for you to get through. Um, it's really important not to fidget and to just stay super comfortable at the lectern if you're moving in person. Um, it's kind of difficult in Zoom to not use the same level of engagement that you would have left turn. So the same sort of hand movements, um, which can be really compelling if you're using them in a non-excessive way, of course. Um, I'm the terrible for it. I always need to hold something when I'm speaking. Um, if I'm just speaking on Zoom, I sort of get the hands going, which can be really distracting when you're mooting and I would not recommend it. Um, but my main point in presenting, which I believe is so underrated, is signposting. So as you proceed through your submissions, it's really important to ensure the judge knows where you're going and why you're going that way. So when you're starting your submissions, you would sort of start along the lines of, uh, I will speak for 10 minutes. The uh, first part of my submissions is point A, in which I will make this point. And the second part of my submissions is point B, in which I'll make this point. And I'll move now into point A. And then as you proceed, tell the judge what you're doing. Tell the judge that you're moving into point B now or that you don't have time for, to, for the rest of point A and you defer to your written submissions for that point and you will move into point B now. So I think that's really important. And you can see some moots where that has been done really effectively. If you jump on Google or jump on YouTube and watch, um, I think the best one that I've seen is the 2021 Jessup Grand Final, which um, the respondents handled their signposting fantastically. And I cannot recommend enough. If you're looking for some really high level um, mooting to watch, um, definitely watch that Jessup Grand Final. Um, so when you start your presentation or when you start presenting to the court, the court will always take appearances or usually take appearances. And at this point, the judge will say, um, I'll take appearances now from the applicant and all the respondent um and at this point in time you have this memorized may it please the court my name is arthur a-r-t-h-u-r -R, initial r and i appear with my learned junior feeney f-e-e-n-e-y initial a for the respondent reveria in this matter and then they will take it from the other side and you kind of move on that way um 
you need to tell the court how long you're going to be speaking for, how long your junior or your agent or whoever is going to be speaking for. And it's important here to note how much time you will be reserving for rebuttal or sur rebuttal, which we will go through a little bit later in terms of how that works into your um, proceedings. Um, so when you start, um, I like to have notes. I'm not like a script person, but I do have to, um, like to have pretty um, fleshed out notes. So it's really important to have those first couple of minutes memorized and ready to go. Um, just have the first sort of block of your text or the first few dot points ready so that you can lock in with eye contact to your judge and know exactly what you're going to say and they feel like you know the case and it can be really compelling to have that good eye contact and to demonstrate a super um, solid understanding of the case and the key issues which you're talking about. Get to the crux of the matter within the first couple of minutes. Um, realistically, you're not going to have that much time. So it's really important just to say, this is the contentious issue for the court. Um, whilst our learned friends may suggest that this is an issue as well, I'm going to spend my time discussing this issue because the court should make a determination in this particular way, blah, blah, blah. So know what you're looking for, I think, is the most important thing. Um, when you start presenting, you are going, you're going to reference a case or maybe some legislation straight off the bat. Um, and it's important in the first instance to give the full and formal citation. So an example there from Strong and Woolworths is you would state, um, as cited in Strong and Woolworths Limited, a 2012 case reported in volume 246 of the Commonwealth Law Reports beginning at page 182. And you may also tack on a paragraph, a relevant paragraph there, citing um, Justice Whoever at paragraph 12, for example. After you've made that statement, you can then say, may, oh, you ask the judge, may you dispense of full citations? And they're going to say yes, usually, unless they're really mean, but that doesn't really happen. Um, I would say I've never been told no. So, and it may be the case if you're the first speaker that you say, may I dispense with formal citations for my junior and I, so that both of you can uh, get off scot-free in terms of your formal citations. And if that's the case, the judge may, and this gets a little bit technical, but the judge may say yes for you and your junior, which means the other side then still has to ask for permission to dispense when they begin their um, speech. So see how you go with that. Um, I know that it won't be that nitpicky at first, particularly if you're doing moot club or junior moot or first moot, but first year moot, but um, see how you go. Um, I did mention before that the judge will ask you questions as you go along. So the main thing that I like to remember is that <clears throat> you're in charge of your own submissions and you determine the path of the argument. So as you proceed through, it's really just you telling the judge what you think is important and what you think is compelling for your case. So the judge is only going to intervene with questions when they're a little bit confused about something or they want a little bit more clarification on something. And this is a really good opportunity for you to sort of just flex how much you know about the case and how much... Um, work you've put in so far and it can be a really good demonstration of advocacy skills if you're able to just handle a tough question on the spot and off the cuff. So the way that I look at questions which we have in the little box there is that when you're asked a question um, it's like sort of a four-step process. Pause, take a breath, think about what the judge actually wants to know and then be able to say yes or no your honour. Um, if it's not a yes or no question, skip that, of course, but um, it can be really compelling to just go, yes, you're on your right, and then pr proceed on with your submissions. Um, however, if you can sort of read the room and read what the bench is saying, um, it's important then to elaborate on your answer, your yes or no, explain why. I think it's really important there to cite a case. Um, the judge is going to listen to you, but only if you've got some authority. So cite an authority say yes your honor this is what happened in this particular case and the court found this and then say uh, as I proceed with the rest of my submissions you can sort of move back in and elaborate but lead back into your point um, it's really difficult to draw a line um, sort of when you stop answering a question and when you move back into your submissions um, it's up to you whether you want to say moving back into my, my submissions or whether you just sort of 
um, make it flow back in. Um, it's kind of personal preference and it kind of depends also on what the judge likes as well. Um, when you're wrapping things up, um, when I'm closing an argument, I, my priority is not on like a fluffy closing statement. It's on making a really compelling point and getting out of there. So you don't waste your time on things that aren't important in terms of if it's not a really important case that you're talking about, or if it's not something that you think is really important to your argument, it's not worth it. So um, in terms of closing, it's good to have some pre-prepared statements to just say, that concludes the submissions, uh, provided that I can give no further assistance to the bench, or unless you have any further questions, I will defer to my junior to continue the submissions or something along those lines. Um, just like a really quick sentence, get in, get out. Um, if you have heaps of time left over, which is almost never the case, um, but if you have heaps of time left over, it can be really important just to briefly summarize the key points of your case um, and just say, it was our submission that this should be um, accepted by the court and we defer to our writtens for any further detail, something along those lines. Um, once you've made your submissions, say you're the applicant, and then the respondent has also made their submissions, the baton goes back to you for rebuttal. So the idea for rebuttal or even so rebuttal is simply just not to lose. Um, it's important in rebuttal to focus on a point of law as opposed to a point of fact. Um, it can kind of be a weak rebuttal to come up and say like, oh, the other side has misinterpreted paragraph 43 of the facts and it should say, they should have said this. Um, it just looks petty and anything sort of along those lines just kind of looks petty. Um, it's more important to pick a point of law in which you disagree with. So if they've misconstrued a key case, for example, or if they've miscited a particular case. So I know in Jessup, we um, focused a lot on a particular case called Lotus and or even Corfu. And those are really often misconstrued or misunderstood cases and our particular applicants or um opposition may have used those incorrectly and we come up come back up that rebuttal and say or so rebuttal in our instance and say um it's really important to note that or that the bench notes that the applicants have cited the lotus case as this when it has been cited and affirmed in this case in this particular way which is directly contrasting the position of the applicants um and it's also important to know if they're using a case from 1950 that has not been cited since and it's been overturned since, bring that up in rebuttal. Um, it's really important, particularly if they're relying on it. Um, rebuttal is not something to get too caught up on um, because it can be really compelling, but it's also just, um, it's only two minutes and the, maybe a minute and the majority of your submission is going to be focused on that content that you deliver before that. So Rebuttal is something that never gets easier because you can never really be prepared for what's going to come in. Um, if you're the applicant, if you're the first speaker, you have kind of 10 minutes as or 10, 20 minutes as your opposition speaks in order to get through um, what they're saying and you can pick things apart. But if the sir rebuttal in particular, you only have that couple of minutes that uh, the applicants are doing their rebuttal in which you have to sort of digest the information that they've presented. Um, which I should probably touch on, so rebuttal, which follows rebuttal, can only be in relation to the issues brought up in the rebuttal. So, for example, if the applicant in rebuttal makes a point in relation to the Corfu case, um, the respondents in so rebuttal can only address the Corfu case in their so rebuttal. Um, I hope that makes sense and I will take questions at the end. So if there's any issues with that, like please bring that up. Um, it can get a little confusing as it goes. Um, yeah, I've mentioned time management, um, but running out of time is really common. And it's just a matter of knowing where you need to be and how you can direct the judge throughout your submissions. So if you run out of time, um, you can defer the judge to your written submissions. Um, and it's really important to have like pre-prepared statements for that as well. Um, which I usually use in the interest of time, your honor. Uh, I may refer you now to our page 12 of our written submissions for that argument. And I will proceed on to my second point if you have no further questions. And they may ask you more questions. And in that instance, you just have to say, in the interest of time, I need to proceed to my second point. Um, I have gotten mixed feedback throughout mooting um, 
on what judges like there. If you are authoritative and you know where you need to be in your submissions, it is totally okay to say to the judge, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to that point. Never ignore a question, but answer the question as simply as you can and then move on. They are going to recognize and understand and respect your time management far more than they would if they were able to keep pushing you on a point. Because it is at the end of the day, more of just a formal conversation and you are in charge of your submissions. Those, if I can get through anything, it's those two points. Um, and of course, if you can't answer a question, that is totally okay. Just be honest, tell the judge at, or the bench and just never attempt to lie because they're going to know exactly what they're talking about. Um, they usually have judging guides. So they usually know what you should or shouldn't be saying. They have an idea of what's going on at least. Um, and if you simply say, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I cannot assist the court with that matter. That's fine. They're not going to push you on it. Like that's not the worst that can happen. So they're going to say, you know, move on. There was one instance where I made a very similar statement. I think I said, um, I can take, this is the furthest I can take this point. Um, and I got asked if that was really how far I could take this point, but that was a very different circumstance. And I can almost guarantee that in moot club or internal moots, that would never happen. It's like, especially if you're new. So wouldn't worry about that. Um, so to wrap that up, your opportunities to moot will be at moot club or internal competitions or external competitions. And I'll let you have a look at that. Um, for beginners, cannot recommend enough that you head along to moot club. You don't have to moot every time. You can just go and watch. Um, and it can be really fun to just watch and see how people approach particular things. Um, everyone has a different style of advocacy. Um, having been on te a team with just five people um, over summer, all five of us spoke and presented so differently. And it was always really interesting and really fun to see how um, people reacted to that. So it can be really fun for you to go along to something like that and just sort of watch and maybe adapt your style based on what you sort of witness. Um, and then, you know, you've got internal comps and external comps, which is the really fun stuff. So do a couple of internal comps, maybe you really enjoy it, really like it. Um, and then you can pick up some external comps, which can be heaps of work, but are super fun. And I know there's some external competitors uh, watching like Ali and they will agree that external comps are super fun. So if you'd like some more resources, there's some QTLS guides on mooting, which will be on the Facebook or will be on the website. There's also some online resources or some mooting guidebooks in the library. So there's one in particular that I have used a lot by Anthony Casamatis in the library. And if you want details on that, um, just reach out and I will send that through. Uh, it's fantastic and it breaks down particular external moots and gives detail on each of those. There's also some really great videos on <clears throat> YouTube. This image here is from Ames Moot 2019, I think, and that was a really good one to watch. Um, this girl fainted and like recovered really easily and it gives you like a good view of what advocacy is in an actual courtroom setting. Um, and other than that, that wraps up that. Um, I will stop sharing. Um, does anyone have questions is the first order of business if anyone has questions. I think Lachlan had a question um, during the speech. Do you still remember your question, Lachlan? Uh, yep. Uh, just had a couple of quick questions if I can. Um, the first one is, as you said before, about the scoring process. Um, I'm wondering whether the moots generally have a correct answer or an incorrect answer, or are they usually a bit vague to allow a bit of um, wiggle room between what is and isn't correct? Um, are we supposed to be getting on the right side or are we supposed to be making the better argument? Um, how does that usually work? Yeah, for sure. So it depends, obviously depends on the moot that you're doing, but most of the problems are going to be fairly vague in the sense that they can be argued from either side. So they you have the problems that you get at least at the beginning are going to be vague enough that you have a really arguable point on either side. There are things as part of the larger problem, there will be points in that, some of which are right and wrong. So the way that you interpret cases or the way that you make particular points will be sort of fall into that right and wrong category. But overall, um, your applicant and your respondent, neither of them are ever completely in the right. So um, for example, I did a moot a little while ago on international war crimes and both parties had committed war crimes um, and neither of them were good people, but you'd, or like good, 
um, defendants or applicants, but you just had to sort of pick and pull different pieces. Does that sort of answer that question? Yeah, definitely. That um, definitely makes sense. Um, and my other question was, is um, we talked about some uh, examples of some appeals today. I'm wondering whether moots are generally um, appellate matters or whether there's any opportunities for prosecutions and other civil matters as well. Yeah, of course. It'll depend on the moot that you're doing. And I'm pretty sure in moot club, it's almost all appellate matters. Am I right there, V? Is that the sort of questions that you're doing? Yeah, pretty much all appellate stuff. Um, but in particular in external comps, um, you're largely looking at first instance sort of thing, sort of proceedings. So um, yeah, depending on the issues, I've mostly done international law comps and international law comps will tend to be um, either, yeah, first, pretty much first instance or merits hearings, um, which isn't an appellate. So merits or first instance, yeah, same. Um, can I interrupt here? Um, so if you're looking for more of a criminal styled thing, we do have competitions like um, witness examinations where you get to act as a prosecutor. So you, there are other competitions other than mooting where you get to kind of flex that and have different um, experiences in court. So try, um, we're going to have a witness examination competition in semester two and also the criminal sentencing competition as well. So you should check those out. We'll have additional workshops to help you out if you're like oh my gosh what is this so um why don't you like um follow us on like facebook clearly you'll follow um and we'll give you a heads up when that's coming up that's in semester two sounds great thank you very much that's all right um does anyone have any more questions um we have a few in the chat if you oh, want to yeah, um, is there an opportunity to come and see yeah, for sure. Um, you can go and watch Moot Club. Um, they would love to have you there. There's usually pizza. Um, yes. There's usually pizza if that doesn't help. Um, yeah, for sure. I would really recommend doing that sort of thing, sitting and watching. And like I said, if you don't want to go and watch, there's heaps of stuff online um, mm -hmm. to have a look. Um, does um, we also have um, the internal competitions have grand finals. So if you want to pop in for those, we normally advertise the grand final dates and you can come over and watch um, people like particularly if you're in first year the first year moot grand final is normally hosted at a law firm it was last year I'm not sure where it's going to be hosted this year so don't quote me um, so you can actually come to some of those and um, you can hear um, people like your peers actually compete and you see the problem because it's the same problem through and through. So you see how they attacked each point and you have the judges there giving commentary. It's a really great experience to come to the grand finals to learn more about the competition you just competed, competed in. So love to see you at those. Yeah, for sure. I, um, yeah, back what B said. Um, so replying to Nat, does every role in the mooting competition require oral submissions in the court? And is there a way to be involved in first year, but work your way up? Um, absolutely. So often in internal comps in particular, you can have a team of three and that means you'll have two speakers and one solicitor, like assisting solicitor, research assistant, which is a really fantastic way. So if you can find a couple of people who are keen to have a chat um, and keen to speak, you can absolutely be a researcher. And even in the external point, um, there's realistically on the team of five, there's only kind of going to be four speakers. So there's going to need to be one person who is the dedicated researcher. And that's not to say that is not an extremely important job. It absolutely is. So if that's something you're keen on doing, um, yeah, that's absolutely an option. And you can work your way up from there, of course, and give advocacy a go next time, which I know can be kind of scary. Um, and how would you go about joining the first year internal moot competition? If you have a team, you can just sign up. And I know someone from internal comps. Okay. No worries, Nat. Um, if I know someone from internal comps will back me in saying that um, if you have a team, you can just sign up and it's that simple. But if you don't have a team, it's also as easy as just putting your name in and they will put you with someone else. So um, don't be daunted if you don't have a team or if you don't have buddies who are keen to do that sort of thing yet. Um, it's just a matter of getting there eventually and they will pay you up. And I have been paired up with people throughout my time in mooting um, who have been fantastic and have gone on to become really good friends. So there's also that it's like shared you know shared bonding time and it's really exciting 
Um, will the slides be available to access? Yes, uh, Nem, these slides or will this particular recording will be on the Facebook page, am I right, B? Yes. Yes. So it'll be on the Facebook page, um, the whole recording. Um, and if anyone wants the slides, just send me an email and I can send those on as well. Um, more than happy to do that. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? I think I've got. Oh, I have one last question. I got it in by email. Okay. Um, so the person would like to know um, what the best moot would be to start off with this year. Um, moot club for sure. Just heading on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't want to be biased, you know. <laughs> and that's not biased. Um, I think it's the best place to start. Um, I personally didn't start with moot club, but I kind of started backwards and jumped into like an international law, internal international law comp and then went into championship. Mm -hmm. which might have been a bit backwards and kind of threw me in the deep end straight away but um <laughs> if you would rather you know enter things a little bit slower start with moot club if you're a first year start with first year moot club uh, first year internal comp mm -hmm. and if you're not junior junior moot is usually in semester two I hope I'm right in saying that yes yes so um junior moot is always there as well um there's one more question there Hannah just wanting a little bit of clarity re-rebuttal how is arguing through the other team misconstruing the case different to the, okay. Yeah, I thought this might clear, um, might cause a bit of confusion. So if you're, in terms of it, what's, what the court might consider petty and what the sort of feedback that we have gotten saying your rebuttal was a bit petty, um, is if you're attacking a point of the facts that the other team has tried to, you know, um, change, or in particular, a point that really isn't that substantive to their argument. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. I'm pretty sure the point that we brought up was actually something really petty. I'm I'm not sure if Ali's still on or if she can remember what I said, um, but I'm pretty sure I told her to say a particular thing in rebuttal and she said it and the judge turned around and said that was really petty. So I'm, if she knows what it is, um, she can She's still but I think, hi, Riley. Um, okay. I think it's hi. like pretty simple. It's, I can't remember the exact point, but it's more like when you say, oh, they said this point about the facts, like the facts could be, oh, they went out to the mailbox and that was an offense. That was an offense. Whereas if you have a case saying, well, it's not actually an offense to go out to your mailbox, um, they've misconstrued that. It's kind of a little bit different. It's more I don't know, it's more attacking their law rather than attacking their understanding of the facts because the facts aren't contentious. It's more, oh, well, they've read this case and cherry-picked it. They've only talked about the dissent rather than the majority judgment. That's okay, attacking their law, but kind of attacking their opinions and their submissions is petty. Yeah, I think that's exactly what the point is. Yeah, just... um make sure the way that you come across I think it's more in your delivery of it too is just make sure the way that you come across in your um rebuttal is still completely um formal and it's not like a, a point to argue about it's still um a formal address and so the way that um we've done rebuttal in the past is sort of hopping up and saying uh your honor or your excellency or whoever one or two points of rebuttal firstly this and secondly this uh in rebuttal you really don't want to waste time um mm -hmm. Is the script for appearances available anywhere? I didn't get a chance to note it. Um, I can send that if you want, but it will be in this recording as well. Otherwise, um, the script for appearances, you can sort of find that online, I guess, I guess as well. It's kind of everywhere. Um, and if you speak second, you can also just copy what the people in front of you have said or the person in front of you have said, um, which is always a good tip. Um, just kind of... If you can, if you get the benefit of speaking second or third or fourth, I guess, um, get to copy and you also get that first person to sort of test the vibe of the judge first and see how things go. Ask uh, Samantha, do grad entry students ever get into mooting or is it generally undergrads? Yeah, for sure. It's um, open to everyone. I've never, never come across yeah. where it's not. Um, particularly in external comps, it can be really popular for grad entry students to do external comps. They have a bit more maturity and a bit more experience. Um, and can often compete really effectively in those sort of external comps, which take six months or, or more to do. Um, oh, I have one question here about 
which you'd be great for about national and international moots that you can participate in. Could you tell us a bit more about that, Riley? For sure. Um, I'll start with like the national level sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, or I guess Queensland level, um, we've got a few sort of comps in Queensland. Um, the first big one that we do is Grudge Moot, which is the championship QT team against the championship UQ team which is a really fun one to go and watch. If you're not competing, um, it'd be really good good fun to go and watch. That will be this year on August 5th. So if you're keen on watching, um, come along to that. Um, The second one would be Quilk. So that's the Queensland InterVarsity Law Championships or Law Competitions, um, Mm -hmm. which in the past is run between the UQ campus and the QT campus or somewhere around that. Um, And that can, you can, get called up for that or put in an EOI for that. Um, That'll be later in the year. I think it's in September. Um, And that's not just mooting as well. That's also, you know, uh, negotiation, client interview, all that sort of stuff as well. Um, From that, on the national level, we also have ALSA, which is the Australian Law Students Association. They run two moots. So they do a championship moot, which is usually a, a problem of, Um, corporate or constitutional or something contracts you know something um, fairly generic and they also run an um, international humanitarian law moot which is um, sort of sponsored by the Red Cross which is what I've done in the past and it is fantastic a lot of work but it's sort of a short turnaround Um, I think we got the problem in like maybe June and we competed in the end of July or something along those lines so sort of a two month, one month, two month turnaround. And you just do a lot of, a lot of prep for that sort of thing. So, you know, um, once you hand your written submissions in, you start oral practices literally every single day um, until the competition. And then from there, if you have really enjoyed national level stuff, um, there's heaps of international moots uh, available these days for QT students. So we've got the big ones like Jessup, ICC, Viz and Oxford IP. And so that's the intellectual property moot. Um, Jessup and ICC are international law, um, issues of public international law, and ICC is international criminal law, um, and then VIZ is international arbitration, which this is the first year in a few years that QUT has run VIZ, and um, they are competing in April, which we're super excited to um, watch along because it's sort of the first QUT team in ages, and it's all on Zoom, so um, that's fun, all those international routes being on Zoom. In non-COVID times, international moots will take you overseas. Um, can't say I've ever had to do one overseas because I've always been in um, teams during 2020 and 2021 and 2022 this year. So, um, yeah, we've done a lot of Zoom mooting with international teams and national teams. So is there any sort of gap in that? Is any, do you have any questions in relation to international or national moots? Is that all good, B? No, you're great. You're very thorough. I loved it. And but if you have any further questions, just give um, Riley an email. She's the yeah, external sure. external competitions director. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll chuck it in the chat now. Um, okay. Yeah. I need to go in my yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's correct. Hopefully that's correct. Um, yeah, are there any other questions? Nope. Oh, good. So if those are all the questions, before we close, I just wanted to thank um, Riley for, you know, giving us her time. I know it's a Wednesday in week one. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciated the presentation. I know I learned a lot of things about mooting and I'm really excited to put them into practice this this year or potentially this semester in week nine. (laughs) <laughs> so um, exciting <laughs> right it's gonna be such a vibe so if you guys have any further questions for us please um send us me myself an email um at director.mootclub at qtlawsociety.com um also um 
I would also like to introduce you to my moot officer, Isabella. Um, she manages the Facebook page. So if you're asking any questions, she's the one responding, me or her. And we also have our high school moot officer, um, Javera as well. I think she's here, maybe not. But yeah, we just wanted to say thank you so much. I will put the, yeah, totally. Sam, I'm Samantha, I'll totally put my email in the chat. Give me a second. I am a woman of a particular age, so it's going to take me a while to type it. But <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for coming and spending your evening with, with me. <laughs> um, I hope to see you at our other events. Um, so please, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, I can't I can't want to task. Okay, Derica QT 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 sorry. Hope that's right. Um yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um I will see you hopefully at the Mood Club. It's gonna be announced very soon. So please um, you know, please be on Facebook. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll let you go now. Love you all. Bye.